Medianoche. 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 Medianoche
it didn't come until much later in my life when I was like 18 that I decided I was gonna make that uh, make that my calling. When I was younger, I was just a poet. Like I wrote a lot of stuff and it wasn't, it was just more of an event for me. And then a friend came by one day and said, I wanna put you on a microphone. And I got all these, uh, I got all these beats, free studio time come by and I was like, I don't know if anybody's ready to, to hear a guy that looks like me coming out of a, a place like this, you know? You'd be surprised, man. Like, I mean, I, I feel you, like, you know, you don't, like, you don't look like, you, know, you Google rapper <laughs> and you you go to images and, like, someone like, like you doesn't pop, pop up. up. But if you keep going, page 13, 14, 15, you'll start to get into the John Waynes and the... Yeah. Uh, and all the and then I saw LP, who's like redheaded. <laughs> he's he's very very Caucasian. Have you, know you ever heard Have you ever heard LP's song, uh, "Stepfather Factory"? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of my favorites. Or did you ever like get into uh, um, Definitive Jux before he dropped like my favorite one that he did was um, it was that love song at the end of. Um, I'll sleep when you're dead. It was a uh, overly dramatic truth. So something about the lyricism in that was just like, um, like he was more he was tearing himself down. Yeah. In front, like to on the track to that person, and uh, you know that's not easy for a rapper to do. They usually don't like to tear themselves down. It's all they. It's all a big facade for a lot of them to build themselves up. Yeah, um, and you know what, man? Like it's it's that approach that I've I've become like um, more. Um, I've been I've been drawn more uh, more towards like. It's, I, I'm not really crazy about just a hundred percent ego uh, all the time. Like, bro, I mean, where's the humility? Yeah, bro. Hey, listen, man. Like, usually, I mean, I remember when I was coming up, the albums that I would listen to, the whole album would be like braggadocious and then like a couple love songs and then you'll have the breakup song and then at the very end you'll have the, the retrospective right the, yeah like the outro and those songs always resonated more with me you know but you had to wait all the way to the end to get to them so it's like you had to be really patient as the guy who appreciates that kind of thing yeah I man i'm not gonna <laughs> lie i'm starting to like the music that i'm making now is is totally like just that you know shout out to this the the last project you just put out that um with where you at that that song really resonates hard with me oh transit city yeah, yeah thank you man yo thank you bro uh i mean shit bro you know thanks man yeah <laughs> coming, coming from around here it's, it's really weird for me because i lived in um a lot of people would say miami lakes but it's on the border of miami lakes and miami gardens and when you look us up in the mailing list we're technically highly so it's it's like um you're like right by Goldman, Barbara, yeah, Barbara Goldman. Kind of, I'm in PSN, over there next to, like um where the park is. There's a park over there with a basketball court and um like a farm store is over there. Okay, all right. I think I know what, what, what were you talking about. That's my stomping grounds. I grew up there and uh, yeah, it's I'm doing my best to make sure that yeah. I guess. I gotta turn not turn down the volume of this TV in the background. No, but that's what's talking about. I'm listening. Yeah, when I was uh when I was a kid down there, it's uh seems like everybody wants to paint you out to be in the in the nicer neighborhood, but it's like you're not. It's you're you're more of like on the extended area. It's kind of it's, it's obviously not a bad neighborhood, but the kids there. Uh yeah, yeah but you know what, man, stuff. like. Even growing up, like in nicer neighborhoods, like the kids, for some, for whatever reason, they uh, they're so infatuated with the idea of the hood that they make it rough. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it, by the time I was done, you know, there was, there was more cop activity in our little suburb than the the neighboring areas around it. You know, a lot of people were, were just swept up in that, and they haven't left. It's kind of weird going to school and stuff, and coming back to to go to the corner store and seeing everybody that dropped out or, or didn't graduate and stuff, they're just, they're still there putting up signs for, you know, handyman stuff. And it's like, bro. Yeah, I wish that there was a way that, like, that our younger selves know, can, like, could know not to, like, slack off in school. 
I, I don't know who it was that made it cool to to decide to be that way. I sucked at school. I got kicked out of high school. It, it took me. Uh, it was it was interesting because I wasn't bad at school. I just didn't feel like I was on the right track. Like that's the thing about uh, growing up when I did. They had so many new schools popping up that. Uh, half of my school's population got diverted to a different school so it's like our teachers our coaches our sports kids everybody got divided and uh they replaced all of our teachers with virtual school and if you weren't on the popularity side of things if you weren't on a sports team or you weren't on the dance team or drama or whatever or in the band you just fell by the wayside 50 percent of my senior class failed to graduate and uh yeah that's wild. Fifty percent in in a nice area like, like Goldman. It's just very weird. Uh, they just didn't have any. Uh, they didn't. The people up the, the, the principal and all those people that were the advisors. They weren't helping those kids. You know, when I got into trouble, they were just like, "Look, we can't have you here anymore. So sign this paper and get out." And then I went to go and get my GED. And found out that I, I didn't even study to take that, and I passed it. So it's like all the stuff that I needed, I got before I got to my senior year. Yeah. You know what I mean? So honestly, if I could tell my younger self anything, it would have been to get out of high school and take my GED in 10th grade so that I could have already been going to college and skip all that awkward social stuff. The only problem is you move up to an, uh, an age group that's... Uh, you know, a little bit of a weird place for you. Yeah. But I still think it's better than going through high school nowadays <laughs> in public schools. I, I wonder just, what high school's like nowadays, especially with smartphones and like... It's got to be it, way it, worse. Like social media culture. Just brain dead. Man, that's wild. You know what I mean? How many people do you look at nowadays, the younger generation, that they're just totally disconnected with your face? They just are waiting. They're counting the seconds to go back to the to the cell phone. And that kind of brings me back to the the mixtape that you that I listened to the first one that uh, I heard from you, that song technology you called it like years before it became even worse than it like, it now it's really bad. But oh hold on, <laughs> which line are you talking about? Hold on, I'm trying the, to think. The hook for that. That's you. You know that. That's, that's it, not that, you. That's yeah, not that's you that made wrote it. it. But but still. Yeah. You know, uh, the whole uh, concept was very well thought. Yeah, man, Mayday, bro. Like, that song, uh, to this day, bro, it's like, uh, man, I wanted them to do more with that record. Like, you know, uh, I, I believe Mayday is, like, uh, talented, but that song is, like, um, what is the word that I'm looking for? Uh, it's got longevity. No, no, lo yes, yes, it does. Well, I mean, uh, uh, but it's just, fuck, man, I'm drawing a blank here. Uh... The word that I'm looking for is not coming to my mind, so I'll just describe it. <laughs> All right, now, like, uh, that song, Technology, like, describing the way it is now is, like, a little scary. You know what I'm saying? Because now everyone is, everyone is more outspoken but silent in real life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you would, you would expect everyone to feel a little bit more comfortable with human interaction but they rely on emojis it's yeah i was talking about it with my buddy my that i make music with uh we were discussing this i got into this confrontation over um over facebook where somebody was just trying to they were they were doing uh racism uh towards towards white people and uh you know i don't i don't think that's necessarily wrong so to speak but it's just when you categorize all white people as one group it's kind of rough because my family's irish so it's like they weren't exactly treated like the best people in the world <laughs> growing uh when they were growing up and coming up into things so it's kind of hard for me to just let it go and but i i i'm the least hateful person you'll probably ever meet i i inspire myself to just remove that from my life completely you know i just I don't fight, I don't, I, growing up I did a lot of that and now I'm like the pacifistic giant that just doesn't want to cause any trouble. But this girl was basically saying, oh, the reason why this is okay is because your ancestors raped my ancestors. And it was like, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I just I can't I can't I can't reason with that. Uh, uh, I don't mean to sound dismissive to people that feel that way at all. Because in their heart, they feel like the circumstances that they're dealing with in present day stem way back. Of course, to their to like the, their ancestors, and, and it's like it, it, damn, it can it can if you let it, you know. Right, and, and that's that's the point that I'm trying to make is that also, you don't know my ancestors. Like my ancestors were Irish, so they showed up drunk and late to that party. You know what I mean? Like they didn't. They, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's be Sorry. real. <laughs> it is. I, I try to lighten it up when it gets really dark like that, but it was just I, I tried to get that side across like, you know, you need to open up your mind a little bit before you just start throwing stuff like that out there. And it just met it was met with deaf ears. And my friend was like, listen, those people in real life would never say those things ever. They, they would never have the balls to, to say that in person. They, they hide behind their screen. And that makes them feel superior, so they say all these hateful things. Yeah, they feel safe. Yeah, but it's 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 not something they would ever say in in a public space. Yeah, like listen, man, like this whole uh, um, you know, this whole r- racial tension that I see er- that I see happening mostly online. Mm-hmm. I never see it in real life, even though like, you know, obviously, bro, Miami's a mel- melting pot. You know? So there's plenty of it. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that in the back of a lot of people's minds, they do have those little deep, dark thoughts of like judging the way that you, the how how much decency you have based mm-hmm. on like your your skin color, and then they associate that with like what culture you came up on. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, Dominican Republic culture is different from Cuban culture and, and Haitian culture, and, and they're racist against each other a lot of the times too. Uh, like my buddy, he's um he's Hispanic, but he's Afro Latino, so he tells me. Uh, be, because he's um he's Cuban, but he's the darker Cuban. That he gets he gets a lot of hate because of that, and um, he's always like they try to speak Spanish around him to try and uh, you know talk sh- talk sh- shit behind his back and stuff. And he he l- kind of laughs because he knows what they're saying and stuff. That's funny. And uh, you know it's just coming from Miami, is different for me. You know what I mean? Because I've been up north, I I can't stand the way it is up there, man. It's just people are very, very close minded and and just uh, they're nice to your face, but behind your back, they're they're not necessarily rooting for you. Um, You know, man, like when you start to look at things from like, I think that when you start to look at things from just a psychological standpoint, I feel like a lot of people might they'll develop an opinion about who you are but they don't mean to necessarily hurt you Mm -hmm. so then the way that they feel about your what they perceive as character flaws they'll let that out behind someone's back because they feel like yo who am i to like just sit here and just criticize you to your face when like so i'll just i'll just keep that to myself but when you're not around it's not going to hurt your feelings for me to be more vocal about it amongst people that 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 i'm okay with Mm -hmm talking about these things too you know and that barrier of like no one is willing to take accountability on both sides Mm -hmm. you know like if i criticize you you call me a hater but if and and then i call you uh incapable like oh you know you you need to grow some thicker skin or just Mm -hmm. something it's like on both sides there's this lack of accountability so then that makes people just yeah, like I grew up in a uh, when I went to work with my dad in construction when I was like 15, 16 years old, and when when you work in construction, you have to have a thick skin because if you don't, those bosses and supervisors will will ruin your life. You know what I mean? They're oh, yeah. pretty they're pretty rough, and you know you just uh, you kind of just have to learn how to take it. So. You grow up with that kind of ethic, and then you go to school here in Dade, where everybody's ripping on each other. That's like the the common thing to do in the classroom, at least when I was growing up, was have a, a ripping contest. You know. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, like where I where I really learned how to grow some thicker skin more than ever. Like I thought I had it before, but I realized that I still had a long way to go. Like I had to develop that real quick when I when I had to do my four months when I was locked up. Mm-hmm. Like when you're there. And yo, those people like they're gonna. That's the way of passing time to that's like the only lighten thing they the have mood. To do. Yeah, they, you know, just just a bunch of dudes, just like just 
cracking on each other, you know? And then that's like some rough. people ain't with it and they, they, they all right, word, let's take it with you know, mm-hmm. you know let's, they don't know let's throw back. one. So, I mean, man, it's funny, bro, because especially coming up like in hip hop with like battles, mm-hmm. you know, like you almost like I remember like uh, in the old school battles, man, like you know you're signing up to get made fun of in some way, so you almost try you you preemptively like make let me fun not of yourself. Right. yeah like listen let me not wear a shirt with a funny design <laughs> let me just not try to give them no ammo let you me know? make sure my tape is fired <laughs> yeah for sure and, and you know what's funny even if even if your tape was like perfect like people are still gonna say it's not yeah yeah <laughs> and that's the whole point you yeah. know like no matter how hard you try. And no matter how flawless, flawless you are convinced that you are, like, people are still going to be like, nah, I don't like you. It was interesting when you were talking uh, yesterday on uh, the podcast that I heard about battle rap and stuff, because I have some buddies that are actually doing that right now. Shout out to those boys, because that is such a tough circle to be in. These guys go all the time. They pay money to, to, to go and do the show and stuff, and they have to wait for for the video to air and to get the reactions from the comments and stuff before they decide the winner. And uh, it's a very long process. And they also have judges too. So it's like they have the judges judging them on stage and stuff, but the winner isn't decided until after they air it and they they show all the comments and stuff. But these guys, the shock value thing that you guys were talking about is real because this guy I know was going against a girl and uh, he couldn't win. He had all the all the stuff pre-written. He spent months working on it, and he put all this extra work into it, and it didn't even matter because, like you said, like they just come out with a small dick joke, and you know. <laughs> yeah, bro. It is what it is, man. It's like one of the, like I remember uh, like there was a point in time when I was real passionate about signing up to battles, and like this was when I was younger. This is we're talking about like ten years ago. Like yeah, you feel like you have something to prove. Yeah, yeah, man, like, you sign up to the battle, and, like, you know, it makes you sharper with your freestyles, and you you, you gotta be quick-witted with, like, like, the rebuttal. Like, they finish the bar, and then the next bar, you gotta come in, and in that one, in that quarter note of the beat, you have to already have something mm-hmm. for them, you know? And, like, bro, I'm not gonna front, man. Like, I just decided that, like, if I'm gonna make, put put energy towards, like, the craft of, like, rap, I'm just gonna redirect my priorities to just making music yeah for me like i didn't ever when i was making music before i made about three mixtapes before I, they're all i threw them away because I, I don't want anybody to hear that stuff just because it was all mixtape stuff that was um sampled or you know i couldn't i couldn't push it and i didn't feel comfortable with the quality of the mix it was all great music it was just it lacked the quality that i've reached now and i do all my production myself so I feel like it wasn't even me, so to speak. Okay. And um, now that I'm working on this new project, I, I've come to realize that I've never actually performed my own material. Every single performance that I've done, I've done a lot of performances, but they were all open mic. They were all a competition of freestyle. Uh, they, I did great, and people, I got great crowd response, but it was never my own material, and that almost scared me for a little bit until I was like, you know, I think it's going to be easier because I have all the stuff memorized. So performing that shouldn't be as hard as coming up with something on the fly. Yeah, I hear you. You have like this, like, this, uh, this, all these archived verses because of the, all these tapes. I've been, no, it's just I've been mixing the, the album so much that, like, when oh. I want to perform it, it's like that those lyrics are going to be embedded in my head and I won't have to, when I go to perform it, I won't have to, like, come up with something on the fly. I can just um, rely on my memory and I know how I want it to sound because I've heard it a thousand times. <laughs> Man, you know, like, uh, on the flip side, there was a point in time that I had all my songs memorized, no problem. Like, I can go to from the oldest track that I've ever done, like, all the way to, like, the song that I did yesterday. I, I'm talking about at the time, you know, this is not current how I am now. Like, at the time, bro, it was straight that I could be like, all right, for sure, put the beat on. And now, for the most part, I'm like that. But the, but I feel like um, it's been a little while since I had a show, too, because, mind you, I've been dealing with this whole situation. Mm-hmm. And, like, in the meantime, I've been doing less shows, but I've been creating, like, 
more content way more music than I ever have and sometimes man I have a hard time keeping up with like oh shit that's right I said that and I gotta run the whole track back mm-hmm. and I'll recite it to myself again and it's like it's, it's a funny duality you mm-hmm. know going from having less music and more shows to having less shows and more music and now you feel like you're having a hard time keeping up with your own like rate of output you know what I'm saying when um when you went on tour and started doing stuff uh, across in LA and stuff um did, how was the fan base over there do you feel like it was uh, stronger than over down here most of, most of my fan base in uh, my bad you were going to say something else well i was just going to say that most of the people that i know down here they talk about how there's not as strong of a connection to the fan base down here for some reason um okay so I'll, I'll, so most of my fans that i that i met were in North California, not in LA. Mm-hmm. Okay, like it's funny you say that because I have this I have this one line on this song that I haven't released yet where I'm like, uh, it's, I go this this nug surely smell like, but wait I speak to Cali and they think it's LA but there's a lot more to it. Mm-hmm. Back to these nuggets, I'm about my duck is the tra- trap game wasn't on my bucket list but fuck it like you know, I keep going from there but mm-hmm. like I speak of California and people think it's Los Angeles. But mm-hmm. I spend most of my time in North California, Humboldt County. Yeah, by, uh, the, grow, by the grow areas. Mm-hmm. Not for nothing, I studied that stuff when I, when I was younger. Yeah, man, I was... Uh, <laughs> that's a whole other... Man, like... <sighs> that's a whole other world over there. But, like, the people that I met over there through my through my uh, um, my homie Adam, mm-hmm. like, like he's, he's, um, he's like the executive producer of the Afterglow project you that, get me? that project was so dope by the way and thank you bro like uh um yeah man like out there he was like yo man i got i got homies that be bumping your shit all the time while we're you know smoking or whatever mm-hmm. and when i went out there like yeah it's true there was a like there was a a, a few people that out you know it's like oh shit like and like yo what's up art and mind you i had never been to california so i go there and it's these people that i've never met and they're like telling me these songs. It's just I, I don't know. I have a hard time like uh, just reacting to that. Like I don't know. I'm just, I'm so used to not being to not having fans that when I finally meet one, I'm like, oh shit, uh, fuck, bro. Uh, yo, are you hungry? Like, what the fuck do I do now? You know? <laughs> yeah, man. But like the so the fans over there. I feel like this is there's like this allure when you are not from. The, so, so from somewhere if you're from another state if a rapper that you're into that's not from your town and you meet them it'll be more exciting to like finally get to meet this person rather than a homie that you are also a fan of but you see them every day mm-hmm. or you see them all the time and you read their Facebook posts yeah. and whatever you know what I'm saying Yeah. so I feel like the disconnect with South Florida is that um it's too, you're too present, you know? Very true. You, you Everybody sees you all the time. Yeah, like, you're not special. Uh, yeah. You know? I mean, not not to say that, like, um, if you go away for a while and you're still kind of present online, it really doesn't make much of a difference, I think, because there's this whole thing of, like, hometown Okay, so, like, there's no magic behind that, you know? Mm. But then once you blow up, Damn everyone nice. wants to rally behind you. Well, then say they were from there. And then be like, yeah, they're not, not, yeah, home team. Mm-hmm. And it's like, uh, like I, I'm not going to lie, I've seen that time and time again. And, you know. That's why it was hard for me, because I, I couldn't really, like, rep a, a spot, so to speak. I, I spent so much time traveling uh amongst Florida as a kid I was always going back and forth from here to Orlando and um, I couldn't really um, I was involved in stuff that I couldn't really be very open about with people so I was always um, by myself or with my family and uh, when it all came to, to be said and done I started making music and everybody was like oh I remember you I knew you from way back and uh Everybody's now really interested in what I got going on and stuff, but uh, they weren't interested before, you know what I mean? Uh, Necessarily about the music, they were just kind of, um, 
they were I was a staple at the time. You know what I mean? And now that's what I want to do. I want to be a staple as far as music is concerned with with um, my engineering and my capabilities of writing and uh, producing. I want to give the Miami sound to people that don't necessarily have it. What do you what do you think is the Miami sound? How would you describe it? Um it's very it's got a very party oriented vibe, but it's also kind of like the after party vibe like um sort of when I listen to the stuff that my friends come up with in the local area that that I'm from in in Hylia and Carroll City and stuff, you hear a lot of like um either after work vibes or kind of like drunk leaving the party vibe you know do you okay so like adding on to that right do you feel like out of towners see miami okay like this is like the psychological oh, approach see miami of, is uh like the mainstream side they don't yeah really like really if see you're not you. from here you you think you associate miami with party mm-hmm. so then you you know edm music yeah uh up tempo, just like whatever you know, party music. But then if you're from here, it's something totally. You're different. not work. You're not at the party. You're working the party. Yeah, I I totally you know? get that. I worked at clubs when I was a teenager, as cleaning clubs. Right. You know, hey, you're a bartender. You're or you're a bouncer, mm-hmm. or you are a barback, or you're cleaning the club, sweeping up while people are dancing. Yeah. So like, you are not excited about cl- club music. Now you want to hear some. Let me drive home and unwind from the club music. Yeah. Let me smoke something. Let me chill. Let me think about where I'm at and how to get to where I'm where I want to be. Because this is the thing, man. Like the song that you showed me, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't sound like Miami hip hop, but mm-hmm. you're from Miami and it's hip hop, so it is Miami hip hop. Well, the great thing about that song was that um, it was more like personal as far as um, those thoughts and ideals for the production. Shout out to my boy ACAs for uh, helping out with the majority of that. It's like his crowning jewel. Uh, ACAs, man. You boy. know him from Geek Squad and stuff, Hell right? Yeah, I know. I know ACAs. He's, bro. Yeah, he said he wants to work with you. Uh, uh, he's gone he's, for the week, but he's coming back sometime soon. He's not in California right now. He's here, right? No, his brother's in Cali. His brother's in Cali. Mm-hmm. Word. Yeah, man. ACA is he? Um, okay, keep going. My for bad. Sure. Like, but um, what's gonna call it? The the song was really sort of like a glimpse into my mind uh and the the mind of the project so to speak it was really dark but it was like the the first words you hear on it are there's nowhere to go but up from here and that's why it was so dark because all the rest is just um all the rest is just really uplifting and and pleasant music and uh that's kind of why i think it has the miami sound there's so much that that i put into it that has that um sort of poppy vibe sort of um it's the production seems mainstream but the lyricism is definitely not um nah word i I didn't pick up on no mainstream uh like uh, approach when Mm -hmm. i heard like no really what i what what i catch from that is like um is how even though like we're from miami we're not conforming to what people expect Miami hip-hop to sound like, you Mm -hmm. know? Like, if somebody drops a mixtape with just Miami instrumentals, they're gonna go to the usual suspects. They're gonna go to the Rick Ross and Trick Daddy and Pitt and Kodak and, like... And and that's, like, yo, this... To the rest of the, you know, world, this is what is perceived as Florida, South Florida sound. It's how I imagine Atlanta probably felt. Yeah, at a like point. man, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna front. I'm just not really crazy about that whole like, oh, you don't sound like you're from here. It's like, well Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I want I just wanna sound like me. I want know? I wanna be different from everybody in the whole world, not just like right. different from my my general city. You know what I mean? Like Right. But at the same time, like on the flip side, okay, so you look let's go back to like ASOP, right? Mm-hmm. ASOP and LP. They're from New York. But they don't sound like. I mean, I guess LP a little bit more. He's got the thick New York. Uh, yeah, like talk, like the. Their accent, yeah, mm-hmm. but the wall of sound oh, is. Yes. I, I wouldn't necessarily associate that with like <clears throat> stereotypical New York hip hop. LP a little bit more because he's, he, mind you, he's been dropping music since like the '90s. You know. I I was so happy to be listening to him before he he joined Run the Jewels. 
and, and have everybody be like, oh, have you heard of Run the Jewels? And it's like, yeah. So yeah, ha- yeah. Have you, have you heard, heard of LP? <laughs> yeah, have you heard of El Producto? Yeah. Have you ever seen their documentary, uh, Revenge of the Robots, on yeah, YouTube? Yeah, I love it, man. Mm-hmm. That dude is insane. I-, I loved... It was really interesting for me because um, when he did Tasmanian Pain Coaster uh, in performance, he, w- he would have this guy come up um, all dressed in black and stuff. And uh, I guess it was like at a time when nobody really knew what he looked like or who he was. So they, he'd come up uh, and the guy would do the whole entire first verse, like, but lip syncing. And then after LP would jump up and it's like, holy crap, it's that freckle dude. <laughs> like, it's so funny. It's just yeah, like the ultimate reveal. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, like LP is a, uh, um, like, I think that LP and Aesop and atmosphere Mm -hmm. these guys are like responsible for or mostly they spearheaded this like abstract dense like much more wordy and heady like hip-hop you Mm -hmm. know it's like you you really do have to listen to it twice you can listen to it once and you might catch everything but like when you listen to citronella by by aesop that that story has so many layers to it you know what i mean in reference to like um like perspective uh, uh, of the people involved in the story he really goes into depth of uh capturing what they were thinking and how they were feeling and the sort of chaos of it all man uh you gotta check out labor days bro yeah labor days and float his second album float i mean mm-hmm. so i heard y'all want to float Man, it's just that album is so. Both of them, bro, they're just really, really good, man. And, and like, how do you feel about like Aesop's production? Like, I like, uh, I like his choices. There's, they have this really, uh, they do have a characteristic of his city, though. You know what I mean? Like, it's very New York vibes. As far as, some of them are are more weird and out there. Uh, like the title track for Nunchal Pass. When I think about it is uh it's really weird but i like it i don't know why it's uh, that real um bell sort of boom, 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 like yeah he's definitely really electronic sound heavy mm-hmm. instead of like and then he'll have like a dj cuts cut some scratches in there it's just a real cool blend of yeah and then when you listen to some of L- lp's production uh from from that out al- from that album i was talking about what i'll sleep when you're dead there's a lot of russian dance sort of uh influence in there from from the clubs up in New, in New York, uh, 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 go on. And I think that's really really interesting because a lot of people don't get that aspect of New York, the the Russian dance space, in hip hop. Um, nah, you know what's funny, man? Like I I, I can't name one. Yeah, I, I don't know any artist uh, that 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 is catering to that. I guess that demographic. You know. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen any of, the, any of these guys live? Have you seen Run the Jewels live or Aesop Rock live? No, nah, it sucks, man. All the people that I really like are so local in their areas that they never make it down to Miami. Uh, Aesop, I, has he, when's the last time he was down here? I don't think. The only time that I saw him perform live was when he, uh, when he came down for his uh, The Impossible Kid album. Mm-hmm. Right? That's the name of the album, right? I, yeah, you know, I think so. The one that he like was living in a barn, mm-hmm. and, you know. Yeah, that's a, that's the I believe that's the title. Man, I was like really happy to see how many people came out to that show. I mean, he sold out the venue, and this is the thing that makes that gives me hope, you know, that although like mainstream hip hop, it seems like it's so much more organized now more than ever, you know, with Spotify, with a rap caviar, and, but it's really the opposite, right? It seems like it's all scattered all over the place. Right, and that's what it's like. Hey, man, like, like, no artist should feel uh, pressured to have to win over a crowd that probably isn't even meant to embrace your music anyway. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like, I'm not saying that that they're not that they can't potentially, but like, like the the people are out there, man. You, you can know? have a whole neighborhood of fans that you've never even met. You know what I mean? And the interesting thing about Miami is that we could be doing great things as far as the artists, but a lot of them develop personal differences and they end up not being able to work together. Like right now, as a studio engineer trying to get artists to work with me, 
it's hard, man, because I get one person there and they're like, oh, man, I, I really like your stuff. I want to work with you. And then I tell them who I, who I worked with and they're like, oh, me and that person go back and uh, so such and such happened. And it's it's not um, it's not going to stop me from completing a project with this person, but it's like you got to be aware of those roadblocks when, when you get into a business like this in a place like Miami where a lot of the artists are just salty at each other for one reason or another instead of, you know, working together. The ones that do work together, they make great stuff. I, I got to tell you, there's a bro life. Uh, I, I see them going on tour and stuff. Uh, they're not even from here. They're from Broward area. But, you know, it's just that idea of uniting with a group to actually go out and do like if you're going to pay to play have your group with you so that everybody's making money so that we can all ride the wave together all bring our fans together and uh that's kind of the only way it's working down here um yeah like i think that the, the way to go which is kind of i don't know if you, i have this pa system that i bought mm -hmm. i have this pa system and i got the mics and all that i have all i have all the equipment necessary to put on a show and that is like my next approach because i feel like um if like there's this alumni of just artists that they that they get along and they put on shows and they're supportive of each other. Mm -hmm. Like that is what's really gonna breed like passionate fans for the next generation and onward. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's true what you say. Like here in Miami, and I know this for a fact. I mean, I've I'm guilty of it. Where like, man, someone will just say something funny sometime, and that's like, it. <laughs> you're cut up. <laughs> yeah, or like they'll or 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 you'll feel like you're not getting the point the the op the same opportunity that there's favoritism you know mm -hmm. like such and such is like uh throwing shows and like you you sign up or like you hit them up like hey what's up let, like let me rock mm -hmm. and they'll be like all right i'll let you know and like it never happens you know what i'm saying yeah because a lot of the artists never actually initiate that like they're they're usually um uh, they lose track of uh, that contact you back the the giving you feedback aspect of it there's too many of us out there that just oh yeah I'll get back to you and then I get on a song or two or three and then uh, I get a phone call that I gotta go and do some emergency and then I forget that happens way too much down here <laughs> yeah listen I, I, but I have this calendar right yeah. I mean I have your name written on that I was like yo he's coming through at noon and today I'm, and I'm here too you know what I yeah, mean yeah so I, I was like man thank god bro I got know? a tire like uh, not for nothing before I got here I checked my tire for this pressure and it was low I can't even fill it up because I bent the stem on, on the tire valve but did I cancel no but see like if more if more uh, homies from the city show the same type of commit like i guess commitment or like just being able to follow through there will be more of a sense of community out here but everyone's on that wishy-washy like That's... yeah yeah i'll holla at you and like it just never happens and then you just move on and i've done that too years ago but like i saw what happens from doing that and i'm trying to make an effort of like being more solid everyone mm -hmm. collectively being more solid you know yeah and a lot of pro the problem is not necessarily um the follow through is the biggest problem, but it's also when you can't make it, is the communication of that fact. You know, like as a studio, since I'm having my studio be out of my house, a lot of people just think that I'm doing them the favor of recording them. But it's like, no, I'm trying to make this my business, you know? So when you schedule something with me that goes, it, that I'm really not gonna miss that appointment ever. Like, 100% of the time, if you say you're going to be there, I'm going to be there. So when you don't show up, and I'm there, and then you don't call or let me know that you can't make it, it's like, would you do this to a, a studio business? Like, oh, would, would you, you want it done to you? Yeah, exactly. Like Or a workspace. Like, if I had a cancellation fee, you probably think twice, right? But because I'm doing it out of my house, I'm just supposed to, oh, you know, you have so much free time. It's like, no, dude. I'm working on stuff. Like, this yeah. is... People don't understand music is a job. It's not just a hobby. And people think that when you do it all the time, 
you're, you're doing your hobby all the time, so you can just hook me up. But that's it's not the case at all. And also, like, just people take for granted just the time, bro. Time, man. Like, in the grand scheme of things, like, yeah, what's an hour? But it's like, exactly, what is an hour? If you died, wouldn't you want another hour? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, in an hour, I can make at least a song or two. You know what I mean? Like, uh, a, a production or two. And I have a whole song idea, like, conceived. And you think that's, like, how much is that worth to you? What if that's the hit that, that takes me to the top? I mean, I know that sounds a little bit uh, like I got a big head or, or egotistical, but I don't think it's it's that crazy. You know I, what I mean? That that one song that you work on. I don't think that it's crazy to think that you just you you take your time seriously, and other people should take not only your time but their time as well as serious. Mm -hmm. Because if if everyone took their time serious, a lot more good things would happen. But people be on that slack shit, and. What comes from it is just a lot of empty promises and a lot of disappointment. And then that makes people bitter. And then we're in this situation we're in now. Yeah, and it sucks, man, because I don't I don't even like talking like this, especially since I don't have my material up. It makes me feel, like, defenseless for when the comeback comes to tell me that I don't really know what I'm talking about. But I'm hoping that when I put this album out, people are going to take me serious because... A lot of the, the stuff I try to share with people falls on deaf ears. And that's not their fault. It's just they've created a, a, an idea of what I am in their head. And it's not going to change until I change it, so to speak. But, but, in the, but man, like 10 years from now, like what you're saying is still going to... like what you're st The message is still going to... It exists already, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you may not have dropped your tape yet. But, but you know what I mean? It's like I don't have the professional... Um, Catalog. Exactly. I feel like uh, so. So when I say what I say, don't think I'm, I'm some big, big time dude who knows more than anybody. I just, I feel like I've learned a lot by being a part of every step of this tape that I, that this album. It's not a tape anymore. It's an album. And uh, that that has really made me aware of how difficult it is to be in different um, positions, like the mixing standpoint, the engineering standpoint, the mastering standpoint, the recording standpoint, the production standpoint, the writing standpoint, all of these things, they they don't necessarily all come together for most artists. They gotta pay somebody along the way. Not all of them follow through and do it all the way through. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. If you, not many people have the patience to sit around and listen to their songs thousands of times do you want me to be honest once i put this album out i don't ever want to hear it again but everybody else i really hope that they want to hear it again you know i made it so that everybody else could enjoy it ah, and you're gonna be hearing those you yeah <laughs> you're gonna you might not want to hear it again but i'm you're going gonna, to you're yeah because i got those songs it. yeah I'm, like, not, I'm not gonna let it fall by the wayside either but you know what i mean it's it's that as an engineer of your own stuff you really are done with that track yeah i feel you like but you'll walk away from it, and then you'll you'll cleanse your ear palate, mm -hmm. and then times in the past, and then you're gonna come back and be like, "Oh yeah, that was tight." Yeah, you know. And before you know it, man, you're just gonna keep making more music, and like before you, you you're gonna get that itch to like make the beat. And I've been dying to ask you this question: Where did you learn how to engineer and pro like you produce a lot of your own stuff too, right? Now I do. Yeah, but yeah. where did you learn that? Because I did a lot of it self taught. All right, so engineering. So my first, all right. I mean, you want. I, I'm gonna try my best to be concise. Long story short, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Uh, for a while, like I saw engineers doing what they were doing, and it looked like the Matrix to me when yeah. I was in high school and out of high school, and I was working. I was in this crew called DMG, and we were working with this engineer called Drop, and uh, you know, Drop. He works with like people in the industry, so I, I, I'm watching this guy just. With just like speed through mixes because he just knows exactly what buttons do what he gets paid by the hour and he's giving them what they want what they pay for like we we used to have this phrase in the studio when it, uh, back in dng where they'll be like or, or, or i'll try to convey to to drop or whoever like get really to drop hey uh just make it sound uh, kind of i just didn't know how to the, the terminology was just foreign to me and i'll be like and he'll just be like yo just chill i'm gonna make it sound good and make it sound good was became this like phrase you know yo 
Make it sound good. Yeah, just make it sound good. Yo, hey, uh, 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 run that take, run that take back. Why? Drop it, just make it sound good. And ha ha, no, but for real, run it back though. And it's <laughs> like, so I just became like completely, uh, I, like I, during that time, this was in 2007, like 2005 to 2007 or eight. Like, um, I only rapped. Mm -hmm. Like my job was to, you right, play the right. beat, I, you know, I rap and like that is, that's it, my job is done, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, and and then like when I left that group, I was like, "Yo, uh, fuck, bro!" Like now, who do I? And I and I went to a couple of studios and I saw that the workflow was totally uh, it varies. Doesn't yeah, it? it varies absolutely. <laughs> and I'm like, "Yo, this is not sounding as, you know." So then I started to pay more attention to what they were doing. I'm like, "Yo, I'll, I'll be like, what is that?" Like, oh, this is the EQ, and I'm like, mm, EQ equalizer. Yeah, okay, I like math. Word, <laughs> duly noted. And I had no idea. The internet, I, man, I wasn't even. I, it was just completely foreign to me. All I was doing was memorizing little characters, the little shapes on the Matrix computer screen. You know, so whatever. Time passed, and I just kept like. Okay, okay. Hey, can you bring up the uh, equalizer up? And they'll be like, oh, you know what this is, huh? <laughs> and I'll be like, yeah. Okay, so he'll bring it up. And then the compressor, I'll be like, yo, this is too much, you know? The compressor, I, dude, I've been salty to for like over a year. And the compressor to me is still, like, if I didn't have my setup the way it was, I probably wouldn't know how to do it. Compression is such a pain to wrap your mind around. There's even Dave Pensado who's like, one of my icons as far as mixing. Yeah, he's a man. Yeah, he is. And when I watch his stuff, he's he's like, dude, I've been mixing for like 30s, so maybe even longer years, and I still don't understand compression all the way. <laughs> he's like... Yeah, like, listen, man, like, like this whole... Okay, so so it's funny you say that, like, so... um, I, So I mentioned in the last episode when I decided to start investing my own equipment because I was going to studio time for a little while and I just wasn't crazy about like just the, the the feeling of wanting to be able to create and having to depend on someone like, like even though no offense I know you got your mm -hmm. studio like I'm saying like like I decided to like just learn how to not to do it to not depend on someone else because of the unpredictability of how it's going to come out when it's out of my hands you know. I totally feel you. So I bought the equipment, and then I asked, like, uh, my first my first uh, computer, like, Mac that I recorded my own stuff on, like, the mic that you're talking into was the mic that I bought, you know? I, I recorded 12 a.m. on that on that mic, you know? Mm -hmm. And, like, so I bought the computer from, like, this, uh, th th this dude called Mike Banger, right? And Mike Banger, like, to me, he's kind of like a local legend. And, and I remember being like, yo, uh what button do I press to record? And he was like, yo, I'm in a session right now. Look, just click the red, you see the, the red button? Click it. So, all right, it's blinking, right? All right, so look, you're gonna press the space bar. You see how you're recording? All right, all right, I'm gonna let you go. All right, peace. <laughs> and I had to just kind of figure it out. And I kind of did. And then I learned enough to just be able to record myself. Yeah. And I was like, all right, yo, do something to the engineer that mix them. Like, yo, mix this for me, you know? Yeah. And like, J5, my man J5, uh, who on the tape 12 a.m., he's on that song Ambitious. Mm -hmm. I'm ambitious. Uh, yeah. that, that, uh, that's my favorite hook you ever did. Thanks, man. Yeah, that, that's, that song, you know, like, uh, yeah, that's a good song, bro. That's um, interesting on my project. I have a song called Stranger Things, and there's like a counter hook at the end that kind of has like the same idea. But where? it's not, yeah, it's, it's, um, um, there's more to this life than a paycheck and profits. What's inside your pocket don't mean that you got shit. Shoot for the stars like a rocket. Don't stop it. It's your set. You got this. Wait. I messed it up. <laughs> no, no, that's cool. I, I, and, you know, that's tight, man. You have, like, that bass... You, like when I was in the crew, I would I would do the bass layers. Okay. Yeah, I can tell your voice has the the low end down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like, <clears throat> so man, like, like, I just like um, is is that hook on on, on this tape? You, mm -hmm. you said it's like one yeah. of them. Well, like so J Five like on on ambitious like he mixed the album, and he did it in like 
a day and a half. I was like, yo, listen, can you just do this as soon as possible, please? He's like, I got you. And and it came out, hey, the vocals were loud, whatever. It, hey, bro, like, he that's the tape. He did his thing. He did his, on that song especially? No, uh, on Ambitious and Dominate, that was Alpha Beat. But okay. all the other freestyles, like, he, mm-hmm. he, he did that, you know? Uh, J5 did that, you know? So I was like, yo, fuck it, this is my tape. But then after that, I really, I, I started to go on the internet and look up how to work at EQ and how to, and I still didn't get it. And I would hit up Alpha B, like, hey man, can you, you know, it's such a blessing to have friends that know it and are willing to like teach you real quick, you know? For me, I, um, when I started going to school, the, the guy who was teaching me was a, a Latin Grammy winner. And he was, he's one of my mentors too. He's amazing, Ed Kaye. Uh He's a saxist and he plays a lot of other instruments as well. But um, he taught me basic mixing on Pro Tools and he could only teach me so much because he, his expertise was in live sound and, um, and jazz. So his mixing was, you know, teaching me how to use a gate to get rid of the, the bleed on drums. Yeah, and, and you know, basic basic stuff I would never use. You know what I mean? In the in the hip hop world where everything's a sample, <laughs> so yeah. so then I ended up um getting a friend of mine who worked as a a chauffeur for an exotic car rental company that was attached to a studio, and he tried to get me in there, but it was it was a shady setup. Being from a background, I I know what to look for, so I, I was pretty sure I didn't want to be a part of that studio. What do you, what what do you mean a uh, shady setup? Um, he had an, uh, several businesses and a studio and a ton of equipment. Nobody knew how to operate it. Uh, you know what I mean? There was a lot of stuff going on that was just um, man, like because when you said shady shady uh, uh, setup, like it it reminded me of this one studio when I was still in DMG. Like we found this studio by the airport and the dude that like rented the studio out used to like shoot porn in the other room <laughs> and when we, when we weren't there and like it like that that <laughs> that is funny that studio like that shady as fuck i'm like yo so this, the couch i'm sitting on right now is on that video oh my god I, like <laughs> did they disinfect it <laughs> yeah i was like oh i remember like get the black <laughs> Yo, yo, Jesse, if you're listening to this you know exactly the studio i'm talking about you know what i'm talking about uh and, and like that studio ended up getting burnt like it was something lit on fire and they tried to say that a long long time ago i don't know it must have been a wiring issue or something like so when you said shady setup i was like immediately re- referred back to the porn arsonist studio no i just i just don't um, <laughs> like i just recently uh watched a bunch of videos and gone to class and learned about diffusers and stuff and i come in here and he has a softwood diffuser on the wall with like uh, pieces of wood this big, like the biggest pieces, like this big. AKA, he paid some some contractor to do it, who was just like, "Oh, I just put a bunch of wood pieces on here and call it a day, and tell you it's some fancy wood, and you're gonna buy it because you have the money." You know what I mean? Basically, there was no love in this studio. There's no knowledge in this studio. It was just somebody who thought they could make some money, who put it together. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm I'm all I'm familiar with. And then People right, like that. yeah. And then right across the street was this dude I went to high school with, who was a DJ, DJed all the up and down the East Coast for a while. And uh, shout out to the scientist, he is a friggin' genius. And uh, I worked with him for a bit, and that guy taught me more about mixing than than anybody. Basically, it was more from observing how he would uh, do things fast instead of um, like him being a step by step coach. For a lot of it, you know, he wasn't necessarily explaining how a compressor works to me or anything like that, but he was teaching me more about signal flow and setting up buses and having your template ready. And um, he, he, he was a really great teacher, but um, because of differences with management, I decided to go and do my own thing, uh, which is to say I decided to learn more of it on my own and... Uh, build my own brand because I wasn't comfortable building somebody else's brand for minimum wage. You know what I mean? I hear you, man. I mean, shit, but like, it, it's a great feeling though, right? To be able to just learn and then you can modify to just shape how you want yourself to sound and, you know, like, it's a great feeling, man. Yeah, that being said, uh, I when I left, I was trying to create a template that was as similar to his as I could thinking that I, I needed everything to sound like him. 
and then you find out that that stuff doesn't work for you. It really doesn't. Mixing is so subjective, and it the t- is. and the tools are so different that what's good for you really might not be good for me. And, and it's funny, uh, 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 like have you ever seen that meme online where it's like a skeleton, like over a mix board and it's mm-hmm. trying to find the right mix the heard, it, heard the the snare for the 10,000th time yeah or it's like a skeleton there like <laughs> laying there like you know man um maybe it's because like uh, uh how much time I've spent like like trial and error but yo like I really try not to take too much time you know I have my template mm-hmm. that works for me and you know I'll turn some knobs and I'll just kind of like make sure things uh, I try not to butcher the song you know yeah for me when i was younger working with hgp and, and the geek squad and the high guys and stuff when uh when they were mixing they always used waves plugins and uh it's because they were the easiest to pirate online and i got them from them and and allegedly it, allegedly but then it got to the point where well i mean this is the thing about those there are they're too expensive to buy, and you want to try your product before you buy it. That's the whole reason why these uh, cracks existed in the first place. So when you get them, the whole concept is to try the ones you want before you buy it so that you don't have to waste your money. And uh, not to say they never did, but when you feel like um, you got $7,000 worth of software, you feel like you're the man, and uh, you don't necessarily feel like you have to learn how to use it because it's free but then I went back and I got a new computer and I didn't want it to die so I bought everything all up front with my own cash and paid for all the plugins that I needed and because of that I learned how to use each and every one of them like I watched every video that they had on each independent plugin until I figured it out because I wasn't about to pay $50 for a compressor that I didn't ever plan on using. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Hey, those tutorials are the best. I love it. I watched every video that Waves has ever put up. (laughs) And, like, Yo Nevo, that guy is so amazing. (laughs) Teaching teaching me how to use uh, VST synthesizers as envelopes. Like, this guy's insane. (laughs) You know, I think that, like, the focus point in hip-hop coming like uh the next focus point on like what member of the team is gonna get the the spotlight of appreciation is gonna be the engineer it's about time man but even right now i still feel like producers they they don't get enough because i mean if you don't hear about anybody but like the two or three major big guys i mean besides the old the, the older classics you know what i mean the two or three new guys are all you're going to hear about and that's frustrating as a producer because it's like there's so much good stuff out there yeah, yeah shit hey, I'm not going to argue with uh, with you on that I totally agree man like I think that uh, producers don't get there's not enough um, limelight to be that, that's like shared amongst all the producers that are truly worthy of that mm. but there are some channels like you know, like Rhythm Roulette on Mass Appeal, mm-hmm. or uh, Andrew Huang. If you ever seen his stuff, his production is insane. Yeah, you know, um, and but I, but I feel like in time, I, as time progresses, like for example, like the DJs, they had they got way up there. Yeah, the DJs was the was the original star, and yeah. then the rapper became the spotlight for twenty years, and then the producers were like, "Yo, okay, what's up? What's up with us?" Yeah, and then but I feel like after the producer is gonna be. The engineer. The engineer. You, you know, know what, I saw this video uh, on Facebook that was talking about photographers and how like um, artists will approach them uh, to do a video for them. And, and when they tell them the price, they're always like, come on, man, like I'm trying to grow with somebody or, or you know, like, why can't you just hook me up? You know, I, I don't understand why I got to pay so much money. And I get that so much as a producer, it's not even funny. And the reason why is because of pirating. It's gotten to the point where people have pirated software for so long that the artists now think that what we have is free. That every producer that has the software got it for free. So they shouldn't charge, that they shouldn't be charged because they got it for free. And it's like, no. I bought every single one of these things, $25, $50 at a time. Uh, It should not be free. I put time into learning music theory 
and I come, I'm writing your song for you, that's the part they don't understand is that as a producer, you should get us a, a songwriting credit, you know, because they didn't come up with the melody for the hook. You did most of the time, unless you're a singer. Like the, as far as the hip hop community, a lot of them are following the line for the melody for the hook instead of uh, coming up with their own melody. So when they say, oh, I wrote the song and you just made the beat, it's like, no, we wrote the song and then you wrote your lyrics to my song. And that's a way different concept than me just giving you some beat and... Well, also, like, you know, man, like, there's so many producers out there that they just be slanging cheap-ass beats. Like, yo, uh, uh, two for 25. And it's like... Because they didn't pay for the software. You know? I mean, or they're just... Tra- they, they, uh, they just want volume. That like, too. You know, fuck it. I'm going to make 5,000 beats in a year, and I'll only lease them, and that'll be my income. Or whatever, you know? Whatever their approach is. And that's the other thing. I was in class, and I learned that you can't really maintain a lease in court for your beat. It's not, it, 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 you can't hold on to it like that. The reason why is because when I write a beat and I, and I sell you the beat, you change the name of the project. So there's no way to track that with BMI or ASCAP once you remake the song. So for me to give you a lease on a track with a specific name, that lease ended the moment I rewrote the name. So you can't even hold it up in court. You mean like save as? Like, like you save... No, I, I mean, uh, like the beat, I name it one thing, right? But when I give it to you, are you going to keep the name of the beat? Or? Oh, word, yeah. It, that, that's the name of the beat. But it, when, they re- when they start writing the song, that, yeah. that's, that name goes out the window. So your attachment to that whole song is gone. So you aren't getting royalties for that, even if it was leased or not. Like, you can't keep track of that. So if you try to go to court with a lease agreement for a beat, it'll never hold up. My professor spent... A whole month trying to explain this to this one girl who just wasn't getting it. She was like, so if I pay for a lease for X amount of units and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you're not understanding me. Once you pay for it, you own it. They sold you the rights to use their song. That lease agreement and X amount of units, all of that is unable to be upheld in court. So it's com- they just stole your song. Like, you just sold your song for, for five bucks. You know what I mean? That's wild. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Man. Copyright's a fickle bitch. <laughs> and listen, like, uh, uh, ever since I started making my own beats, man, like, I just... <sighs> the only way it works is if you get a co-writer's agreement. As a producer, when you do the co-writer's agreement, then the mechanical royalties, like, your name is as a feature. Now that solidifies your mechanical royalties for that song and the ownership of the copyright but if you give a beat to somebody and they change the name you're not getting anything for that ever damn that's wild man i i i just i can't see myself doing that to any other producers i ever work with it's like no i got you bro (laughs) you know what i'm saying like that's crazy how someone if they really wanted to they can go down steal your stuff and that's what they do online is when you post something on on your website Somebody like Childish Gambino or somebody can come and just buy your your beat online for whatever low price you set and go and use it and change it somehow. Uh, They don't even have to really change it, but they could change it somehow and then it's less noticeable. You know what I mean? And it's, it's... they can take your stuff, man. It's funny, like, you mentioned Childish Gambino. I I imagine him downloading some beats and and they try to, like, like, put up a fight about it. He just... The meme pops up of this is America. You know what I'm saying? He's just looking at that little pose that he does with. You know what's like, so cold about that is that ACAs told me a story about how he actually had a beat that he gave Childish Gambino that was used on one of his earliest projects that he didn't get recognized for. Damn. And it's just, the, he called him. Like they actually had words, like word on word contact, and he was like, Oh, I like it, but it's sampled. Um, is there any way that you can send me something original? And he's like, oh, yeah, I got original stuff. And he sent it to him, and he's like, okay, I'm going to check this out, and then I'll call you back. Never hit him up. And then six months later, he drops an album with a rebuild of his beat. I listen to your demo tape and act like I don't like it. Six months later, you hear your lyrics on my shit. 
Yo, 100%. Damn, come on, man. This is America for real. Yo, AC Ace, is, he's going to get his just due, man. Like He's amazing, dude. He, he's very, very dope. Not for nothing without him as a producer, <laughs> your boy would be in some serious trouble because my ear for bass is not... It's like I have to struggle really hard to get that bass right. For bass? Yeah. Bass as far as like um, musicality and notation-wise. Oh, okay, I got you. It, it's so important for you to be hitting the right bass notes. And uh, I have a problem because I never... I've always played treble instruments, saxophone and stuff. Yeah. So understanding how to play a bass is uh, tricky. <laughs> um. Well... Like, you know, man, that song that you showed me, like, I enjoyed listening to it, listening to it. Uh, do you have a release date for your album? It's going to be, the trick is I'm trying to save up to do visuals and stuff because I don't want it to flop. But, uh, you know, Adrian Roxo? Yes, I do. Uh, I was going to reach out to him because I saw his video recently. Whoever did the editing for that did a really great job uh, with green screen stuff. It's really not that expensive. But uh, I was gonna hit them up to see if they would do like lyric videos for me, cause I feel like that's I'm so into my lyrics that that's kind of um, the route I was thinking of taking. For, yeah. For plus it's quicker, cause I I'm not a I'm not a great idealist when it comes to coming up with visual concepts. Yeah, for yeah, I got you. It's just like not not, it's not your focus point. So. Yeah, I don't I don't think I I like I feel bad going to a director and being like. I have no vision, <laughs> so I want you to hear this song and try to help me come up with a general... There's some directors that love that. I know, but like, most of them hate it, like, because it's like, what do you mean you have... What? So how do... Like, you know what I mean? They just... Uh, it's not that they aren't creative, it's just that they feel like if they gotta do all the work... Yeah, like, it's like, yo, give me something to work with, fool, like shit. <laughs> now, okay, so you don't have a release date because you're working on visuals now. Uh, I got... It's, I'm, I think I'm going to have it dropped within two weeks. I'm going to try and set up an album release somewhere, most likely at Rent Spot over in Wynwood, uh, because a lot of friends I know have been performing there. Uh, I'm trying to release it so that when I go back to school, I can talk to my professors about doing performances on campus. Word, man. They, they are always willing to help out people, man. Shout out to Dade, uh, Miami Dade College. Yeah. Those, it's a, it's a transit college. <laughs> like, the college, they don't have anybody, nobody lives on campus. Everybody comes and goes and stuff. And uh, they have so much artists that, that work really hard doing camera stuff and doing uh, all the music. And the performers over there are really great. And, um, yeah, man, they, they got a great program. Uh, I don't want to say it's better than a lot of places because I hear great things about SAE, but something about the freedom and the the comfort that they have over a date is great. It's just, um, they... But shout out SAE, though. Yeah. SAE is, is an awesome... Uh, is an awesome school, man. Like, Alpha Beat, uh, Frank, you know? Like, Frank, mm -hmm. Frank is... Uh, one of the head guys over there, and every time that I went there, I, I, all, the, all the students that I see in the halls and the classrooms or whatever they always look like they're having the time of their lives just learning this awesome craft you know audio engineering and producing you know yeah it's crazy man I've, I've grown up with so many artists that are now um, everybody's going in different directions musically and uh, it's a good thing it's just uh, makes it harder to work together because the genres are so uh, spread apart uh, I would imagine that would make it more fun I would think so but it's like my my uplifting messages sometimes would probably not be heard on a on a more new age mumble setting. You know what I mean? I I want to be involved in production so much that that's probably where I would shine in something like that. Is like, um, you know, man, like, like, let's uh, like, I kind of wanted to. I'm I'm actually happy that you said that because this was I had planned to make this like the closing note, like. Even though the music that you make isn't surface level, like mumble, the music I make, like mm -hmm. it ain't, like, it ain't mumble rap. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But to my surprise, like the people that it, that favor mumble rap, like they also like your stuff, don't they? They'll yo, they'll bump like an MF Doom. Mm -hmm. They'll bump uh like. Uh, 
it's almost like their tastes are wider, isn't it? Yeah. It's not. It's 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 that's that's crazy because I think that's like a sign that uh, the music is evolving to a point where you can the same people that's listening to mumble rap can also listen to hard rock can also listen to me, but it's also disheartening because you don't get that same fan base. Well, like if you look at a festival lineup, and you'll see that you'll see a. You'll see a Suicide Boys, yeah. and then you'll also see like Atmosphere, <laughs> and then you'll see, uh, you know, uh, wh- whoever else. But the audience is all there. Mm-hmm. These people pay to see all these guys. Mm-hmm. So it's like, with that being said, like just focus on being you. You know. I think it's a sign that things are evolving, but it's also that it's the AD the ADD mindset is so so much that people just can't focus on one thing anymore and uh i think that's scary when you think about it because our fan our fan structure has to be completely different because back then you had these diehard fans that were just like all about one genre and like they lived their life by a specific genre and now it's like people are just so diverse that um they're just a a citizen of music i guess yeah, like, would you rather have a hundred diehard fans or a thousand casual fans? Mm-hmm. Dudes you know? who are just, like, jamming, period. Yeah. I mean, really, shit, man. Like, I, I, <laughs> Buy it. <laughs> yo, thank you. Hey, listen, yeah. you enjoy my music? Yo, my man, thank you, you know? And, like, that's why, I like, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, like, uh, push this, push this, uh... This narrative of, like, listen, just be who you are. Instead of trying to, like, mind you, like, at one point in time, I was just a young young kid, and I went to an Atmosphere show, and I was already playing with the idea of rapping, and, like, that show and the conversation I had with Brother Ali when I was in high school sold it for me. Yeah. And now that I'm, the age that I'm, that I'm at now, and I have conversations with some young homies, and they hit me with the... Yo, check out my tape. Like they're a little bit too eager. It's like I'm, I was there once, mm-hmm. so I could understand what it's like. Cause if I had a tape, I would have probably passed it to uh, that's brother Ali too. You know, that's the way it's different though with me. Is that like my older stuff? I was so, I I don't know, I didn't feel proud of it as much. I felt like, yeah, I'm a rapper, but only if you say I am. Sort of like I would have to get my friends to be like, oh, did you know about this guy's stuff? Oh, he's pretty dope. And I'd be like, eh. Yeah, but I was, now I was like, like that for a while, so I know exactly what you're talking about. You're almost like embarrassed to say you're a rapper. Because you don't feel like the quality's right. Ever. Yeah. And then now, this album, bro, I put so much work into it. It's like if anybody asks me, I'm a rapper. I'm an engineer. I'm a producer. I'm everything that this project needed and more. And, you know... It's going to be great, man. I really I really feel like um, not many people can say that they put a project together where there wasn't one song that people would skip. You know? Does that make sense? Yeah, because you, you, you nurtured that track listing from beginning to end a hundred times over. I started with it as just production. Like, I had a lineup of beats, and I was like, I want to create a vibe before I even start writing throughout the thing and then I ended up totally reformatting it because the beats were horrible yo it's funny man like like when I when I was making Transit City like the first song that I made technically the first record that I made was Where You At with with Rev cause I had to put it out that song is so dope and then like and then after I was like you know what I think I'm gonna put a project out and I worked <laughs> on Strangers and then I remember I was like I would I was, I was making beats and out of the seven songs that's on Transit City. I must have made no more than like ten beats. Yeah. And I was like, ah, this is not gonna go on here. Out and of the original sixteen, uh, like I originally had sixteen, and out of the original sixteen, probably two of them are still there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, word, word. Oh, so it's like the opposite. You like totally reformatted trimmed that bonsai everything. tree. <laughs> like it was horrible because like I listened to it and it was all. I'm not gonna lie. This as much as I want to say it was all me. I didn't do it by myself. The production. I did it with Ace. Ace was um, like sort of my guide because people's tastes are so different that um, I feel like if you do it by yourself, it's never going to come out right. You need that bouncing board 
to sort of let you know that um, it's there's a consensus. Like people are gonna reach a consensus about your product. It's not just um, and that also gets rid of a lot of the pain you feel from people not digging your choices. You know what I mean? Get that get that out of the way. Find a sounding board to to bounce the ideas off of. So when I showed him what I had, I was like, because I told him your last album, I want mine to be like that or or better or equal. You know, like that's the type of quality I'm searching for. So when I showed it to him, he was like, Yeah, man. This is not what you're gonna. This is your debut tape. We got we got a lot of work to do, the, and out of all of them, he said, "Oh, we can change this. We can change that." And then at the end, I was like, "Man, the vibes are not the same anymore. The writing that I'm coming up with doesn't work for this." In total, it only took me six to eight months to come up with this project. I probably started it over a year ago, but the actual project and the lyrics and stuff they only took me about six months. Six months is about the is about like the average time for an album. So. It should be, it, but I know too many people who take way longer. And when you hear, when you hear how it came out, like from start to finish, you're gonna be like, wow, because the the every song has a hook. Every it's every song has a hook. Let, uh, let, let me uh, <clears throat> let me touch on something real quick. Like so, atmosphere, right? Like mm-hmm. this is something that I wish that I saw more of. And I'm interested to see how the modern day version of this would play out. But like, so atmosphere, right? Um, they would have their album, right? Mm-hmm. And aside from their album, when you go to their shows, they'll have this series called Sad Clown, Bad Dub. Are you familiar by chance with that phrase at all? Sad Clown, Bad Dub. It's like a, it's kind of like a B-sides series, you know? It's like, hey man, like they would only print out like a couple hundred of them or something, you know? Oh, I get what you're saying. And they're they're like B side rough mixes, the, un, yeah. unmixed, unmastered. Only real fans want them. Lo fi, yeah, s- sloppy, but that gave it the the, the aesthetic, grit. yeah. Mm-hmm. And to this day, if you go on YouTube and you look up a sad clown bad dub tape, you'll and you scroll down some of the comments, the fans are like, "Yo, this is my favorite song from this guy. <laughs> Yo, this is my favorite. I can't believe I found it." Yo, oh my God! I can't believe you found you. I found this song because so, so uh, it's interesting how an artist can put all this focus on creating the perfect track list for an album, mm-hmm. and the songs that didn't make it are the are their favorite ones. Are the favorite ones. So it's like with that being said, it's almost like it's like um, people are just gonna like what they like and you would almost be doing that song a disservice of like neglecting it from its potential favorite listeners you know Mm -hmm. some of the songs that i removed were just they were great songs but i was dependent on features and i was like those features fell through and i was really sick of um of waiting around and stuff so i repurposed the lyrics for a different song that i did for myself and the writing, that's the writing and the engineering are the two things that were basically like, I can one hundred percent say I did them, you know. The production I share credit for because Ace, Ace really did his thing on this album. For me, it would be a disservice to him to say that I did it all myself because you can't come up with stuff like that without a partner. You know what I mean? Like that's why music sounds so much better in collaboration. Not to say there's anything uh, bad about solo work, but it's just co- something about collaboration on the same wavelength with another artist really, um, it reaches more people. Yeah, it's like food. Like, listen, you can throw, you can only put salt on this food mm-hmm. and, the, and like salt will be proud of the meal. But if you throw in another ingredient, it just opens this whole new world of combination mm-hmm. that most likely more people will be able to enjoy if that you know if that was the approach that you wanted you know but like how Rev said yesterday like only you know how to season your steak you know what I'm yeah. saying I actually liked what he said about that but I wanted to shout out like that uh, if you read any book they tell you that you really shouldn't mix your own stuff they say that you're supposed to because you're so biased that you cut through your own mix a bit because we're, we we have these um ideas of like we sound bad I know because I I butchered my mixes for so long before I figured out how to do it right that it's like it takes a special kind of person to be able to mix their own stuff 
you know, like when like when I mix and master my own things, like I'll just I'll send it to home. He's like, yo, what you do you have think? To. What do you think of this? The their set of ears is like a lifesaver for me. And Without like, it, you probably lose your mind. And how many times do they tell you that it sounds something's wrong and you got to go back and change it? Some some of my homies are more critical than others, and I'm I I, I, I want little details like yo, tell me if is the reverb too high, is mm-hmm. the snare too low, like. What's up? Oh, you know what? I was gonna ask you yesterday before we end. <laughs> like you said that you like like uh, you said that uh, you're like oh some songs I don't, I'm not sure what to say in the beginning or the end. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And like like you know. basically, um, I'm a lot of my songs have dead space at the beginning and the end because I'm not a uh, I'm not that fresh uh, coming up with little ad lib stuff on the spot type of guy. I'm really. I'm so precise about everything that I put on to recordings that they're, it's always empty. And I have, my last three projects were just so like that. It was just a name drop or no name drop, just pure beat. And then I realized that it's because I'm a producer and I wanted to let the beat shine, but you're doing yourself a disservice because people need to hear some kind of uh, life in your song. You know what I mean? So... Yeah, um, uh, uh, I hear you, man. Like, and and it's a little funny thing to kind of like get over, but after a while, you just you press record, the song starts, and you'll just be like, yeah, 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 yeah. Now nah, I'm just here. I right, yo. <laughs> yeah, but even then, I overthink it. I'm like, but why? Why did I have to say that? Like on this other song, I say that too. So or check it. Like I say, check it too much. So I gotta change it somehow. So, like, what I did for this tape was I, I tried to think of the concepts of the songs. Like, one, I have Lighten Up, so I took my Roar bong and I fucking put it up to the microphone and took a rip right in the beginning. And then I did this, like, reverb push on the exhale of my breath so it, like, fades into the beat really cool. It's like... Phew. That's tight. See, not, you're using a... You're using a, a pl- plug-in... You're using plugins as instruments, mm-hmm. you know? Like, yeah. that's awesome. You know, it's funny, man. Like, real quick, like, that, that song that I just put out, Spinning Slow, like, at the, in the beginning, I, I go, you ever just sit back and just, and nothing came? I, I didn't know what else to say there. And I was that like. That was so dope. And I was like, you know what? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, it kind of, in a weird way, fits with the song because that song is when you sit back and you just kind of, like, no words come to you because you're just processing you know, it's almost like that moment where you hit the blunt or you hit the joint and somebody's like, what were you going to say? You're like, oh. Yeah, that yeah. little, it's all in your head. So that's why I was like, you ever sit back and just, and it's just silence, you know? Yeah. What just, was that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, but look, man, we've been talking for uh for over an hour. I know that some 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 uh podcasts like Joe Rogan, they'd be talking for like seven hours. And like when I used to work with Drink Champs, like Nori, I remember the episode when Nori had uh, Swiss Beats. Like, Swiss wanted the, it to keep going. Ask me more questions, and like EFN's <laughs> like, I gotta use the bathroom, bro. I'll be right back. And like people were just sitting there waiting for it, and it's like a four-hour podcast episode. So like, you know, I'm kind of hoping to not have it drag on that long. But we've been talking for almost an hour and a half, man. Well, for me, it's like I spend so much time in my cave. You know what I mean? So to to talk to somebody who's actually uh, uh, passionate about the same field and actually knows what I'm talking about, because man, I talk to I talk to my friends and family, but this stuff goes right over their head. Like within the first sentence, their eyes glaze over and they're like, "Yeah, compression." And yeah, you're you're like that guy in that episode of The Twilight Zone that he's on Mars and <laughs> and they drop off a robot to be his companion and your and the robot to him is like your laptop to you. Oh yeah. And like the only person that understands is the people that come by and uh, drop off that guy some food and books for the next <laughs> two years, and I'm the guy that went to Mars. Yeah. Uh, in this uh, analogy, so yeah, I feel you, bro. Like I mean, I could talk about this all day, man. Um, but yo, this was fun. Yeah, man. You know what I'm saying? Do this again. Once the album drops, I want to come on and talk about that, man. That's going to be interesting. There's a lot of concepts in there that are really cool to to go over. You don't have a, a release date yet at the moment? Uh, two weeks, I'm going to have a single. I'm not sure which one, okay. but I, it's going to drop. I got I to gotta get a move on with this. I've been doing all the intros and outros this week, so that's going to be finished by Friday, and then everything else is just distribution and paperwork. Okay. Visuals. 
Well, shit, man. Like, uh, be proud of yourself, bro. You know, you finally. Yeah. And before you know it, as proud as you, as proud as you are of this project, you just gonna start working on another one. And it's just gonna be another project that you're as proud of. And time goes on, more projects come out. And yeah, I think the next one I'm gonna avoid doing like a a concept album and just let this one be more freedom, because. <laughs> The last one was just so much work and it was stressful and it was like coming to grips with a lot of issues from the past that I wanted to close the chapter on. So I want the next one to kind of be all about the future and just have fun with it. Word. Well, on that note, let's close this up, man. We got sure. Ghost of Young Sage here. Ghost of Young Sage. Where can they find you on social media? Sagecraft Studio on Instagram and Roaring Rapper 420, I think. Uh, as an artist, I, I gotta, I gotta, but uh, I got my website that's about to come up, sagecraftstudios.com. I got my email, uh, ghost of young sage 2431 at gmail. So um, hit me up if you're interested in any work. I specialize in production and vocal recording. So, word, my oh, man, for sure. That's tight, bro. We out of here, right? Medianoche. 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 Podcast. 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 Medianoche. Podcast. 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 Medianoche. 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 Mediano